Good morning, friends of faith at Landmark Community Church. It is such an honor to be here today and bring the Word of God to you. And um, God's got something good in store. And I believe you're going to leave here different than you came. And I believe you're going to experience uh, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's here to guide us into all truth. And to set us free from the things that have had us in bondage. Amen. Amen. So if you would, bow your head with me. I'd like to open in prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. Your word is powerful. You said it. Your word is like a hammer and it breaks the rocks to pieces. God, I pray that you break the hard places in our lives to pieces and brings in the good things that you so desire to give us. Father God, I pray right now that you massage every heart in this building to prepare it for the word of God. Pray right now that every person break up the fallow ground of their heart. Father God, right now we just thank you for this opportunity to hear your word and to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't have any New Year's resolutions. I don't have three steps how to get clean and sober or two steps to lose weight or... Or any of that kind of stuff. I don't have any of that kind of stuff today. The title of the message is Break Breakthrough for You and Free in 23. So Cheryl in her little uh, video she does on Facebook says, If you didn't get a breakthrough in 22, you can be free in 23. So that's what it's going to be. So before we get started, I'd like to make some announcements. On Wednesday nights, we have Living Free Recovery Class at 6 p.m. Living Free, as if you're struggling with something in your life and want to get free, we'd love to have you. On Wednesday nights, we also have Bible studies with Scott right here at 7 p.m. If you've never been to his Wednesday night services, they are incredible. He teaches the Word very well, and uh, I highly recommend that you come. Amen. Because we're cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. We need to hear the word because the word changes us. It's supernatural. <clears throat> On Sunday at 9 a.m. I do a class called Understanding the Bible over in the mansion. Love to see you there. On Mondays at noon we have a ladies Bible study here every Monday. Another great class. And beginning on January the 12th we're going to start a new love and respect class at 6.30 p.m. over in the mansion. Very powerful. I want to recommend anybody that has not been to the Love and Respect class, please sign up back there. You got to sign up, put your phone number and email. And, um, you know, there were some people that didn't quite get to finish it last time. If you want to come back, just please put your name on there so I know who's coming. And uh, we'll be glad to have you again. Anyway, it's very powerful. It'll change your marriage. It'll actually help your relationships overall. It's just that powerful. It's only 10 weeks. And uh, I don't do the teaching. That's a video. And the guy's super funny and you know it, it's a good time amen and you change amen so i highly recommend it so today what i want to talk to you about is a man named elijah now let me just tell you something real quick in the old testament there's two guys one's called elijah and one is called elisha now if you're like me you get these old testament names kind of crisscross sometimes everybody smile nod and say amen amen so Elijah came first because J comes first. Elisha comes second because S comes after J. That's how I remember it. Amen. And Elijah was a mighty man of God, powerful man of God. But in James, he said he had the same nature as we did. So he struggled with some of the same things we did. Amen. And we're going to look at this story and how it relates to us today. Amen. And I'm excited about it. <clears throat> Amy prayed about watchmen in this church. And God is raising up some Elijahs in this church that are willing to stand against what's going on in the world. Amen. Yeah. And so Elijah shows up on the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17. And he goes before a wicked king named Ahab. Now Ahab is the most wicked king ever in Israel. It says that in the Bible. He was the most wicked of all kings. He didn't start out that way, but he married a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel had a great influence on this man, and she had no God in her life from the beginning, and influenced him in many ways. Now, if you've never read the book, The Paradigm, by Jonathan Kahn, he makes this analogy about Ahab and Jezebel and Bill and Hillary Clinton. And it's incredible, it's incredible the timeline, the things that happened, and everything that correlated 
exactly like the Clintons' lifestyle. I've been following the Clintons since I was, man, wow, my daddy gave me a little book called Slick Willie when I was just a young whippersnapper, and he said, you got to stay away from this one. <laughs> I said, okay, so anyway, the Clintons. Anyway, I'm going to read a verse to you, verse 1 in chapter 17. There's not much said about Elijah. There's no lineage where he came from or anything. I mean, you know, his family life or anything. So Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, so he's standing before the king. He's standing before Joe Biden right now. As the Lord of Israel lives before, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word. The nation went into a three and a half year drought. Now, the reason God brought a drought is because he brought judgment on that nation. Keep in mind that God judges people, and he judges nations, he judges households, he judges city councils, he judges school boards, he judges people that get off track and disobey his eternal rules of law. Amen? And so it's just his nature to do that. He doesn't want to do that, but he has no choice. His hands are tied because he's a just God. <clears throat> Ahab reigned in Israel for 21 years. Now, let me just tell you a little something about Elijah. He leaves this, he leaves this place uh, in front of Ahab, and he told by God to go to this brook, Brook Cherub. And there he's fed supernaturally by ravens, and he's taken care of during this drought. And over a period of time, God tells Elijah, I want you to go to Zarephath, and I want you to see this widow, and this widow is going to take care of you. God supernaturally provided for this man. It's a picture of us. If we give our life to the Lord, he says, I will meet all your needs according to my riches and glory. So God says, I will take care of your needs if you follow after me. So he gets with this widow, right? And he says, make me a cake. She says, I only have a little bit of flour left in the bin. And I only have a little bit of oil in the jar. And he says, make me a cake. And she said, well, I was going to make a cake and my son and I were going to eat and die. Because the famine was so severe that people get hopeless and helpless. You ever felt like that in life? Hopeless, helpless, things not going your way. That's what this widow was feeling at that time. But she obeyed the voice of the Lord. You remember the voice of the Lord came through, through prophets in the Old Testament. And she obeyed. And she made that cake for Elijah. And guess what happened? The bin didn't run out of flour, and the jar didn't run out of oil. It's a picture for us that with a God, a little goes a long way. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Amen? Don't despise those little things in your life. I'm going to read some verses in 1 Kings 17, 13 through 14. And I want to read what I just said. Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Do as I have said, and make me a small cake. From it first and bring it to me and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of fire shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the Lord sends rain on the earth. Amen. So what we see here is God is judging Israel because of their idol worship and the pursuit of false gods. Now, Scott told me how to say this, but I've messed it up. Baal or Baal or something. I call it Baal, the God of Baal. I couldn't get it right. I was trying. <laughs> he knows Hebrew real good and Greek. So the God of Baal is a God of prosperity, fertility, and increase. In the church in America today, there's many churches that worship the God of Baal. I'm not playing with you. This is the truth. Very much greed and all that stuff in the church today. There is nothing wrong with having money as long as money doesn't have you. <clears throat> they were also worshiping the god of Ashtaroth, a female counterpart to Baal, who brings all types of sexual perversion into the nation and into the temple. At this particular time, there was some crazy things going on in the temple. There was all kind of sexual acts in the temple of God. The priests were worshiping these false gods. Amen? So it reminds me of America. I want to give you a few dates about America. During the 50s and 60s, there was a sexual revolution. And at that time came the birth control pill in 1960. The sexual revolution was now on, and it was sexual freedom for everyone. No more restraints. In 1953, Hugh Hefner came out with a Playboy magazine, and things changed drastically after that. 
<clears throat> and it brought about more freedom to have sex whenever and with whoever a person wanted. I wrote down this here. Larry Flint. Anybody remember Hustler Magazine? Larry Flint. He was a piece of work, I'm telling you, boy. Mm. Hugh Hefner uh, was called the prophet of hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, sensual self-indulgence. Good old Time Magazine praised him then in 1967 and at his death when he was 91 years old. They put a big old picture of, of um, Hugh Hefner on the front of Time Magazine when he died. This is what they said about him. Hold on to your seat. Hugh Hefner is alive, American, modern, trustworthy. Trustworthy? Hmm. Listen to this word, clean. Not a clean part on his body. Respectful. He had no respect for women. It, it all came out later on how he treated women. And it wasn't respectful. And the country's leading producer of spectator sex. The same thing was going on in Israel that's going on in America today. Let me tell you something a little about, about sin. Sin is never happy. So sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will cost you more than you want to spend. And sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. So what happened in America, we let a little sin come in. A little bit of sin, you know, just, uh, you know, no, no top on the breast kind of pornography and look where it's at today. We, let a, we let, gave homosexuals rights. Look where it is today. Sin never stops. It's like a wildfire out of control. It continues to march forward. It's the same way with you in your personal life. Sin's never happy. It'll assassinate, then it'll fascinate, then assassinate. It'll thrill and then kill. That's how sin works. Larry Flint said religion has caused more harm than any other idea since the beginning of time. There's nothing good I can say about it. People use it for a crutch. This is these wicked people that started all this. Job 31 1 says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? We've got to keep our eyes right. What are we looking at? 1962, the Supreme Court redefined the meaning of separation of church and state. And it excluded biblical teaching from our schools. Hold on to your seats. This is interesting. The statistics of what happened after this is astounding. Every type of crime, sexual immorality, assaults, rapes, everything skyrocketed 700%. Every single thing. You can look it up and I'm telling you the truth. Some studies say 2,300%. Guys, you remember when you had a pickup truck and you had a 22 rifle in the back? You left your windows down when you parked at high school. Nobody shot anybody. So they did this, and guess what they had to do? They had to put guards at schools with guns because crime got so bad, especially in the inner cities. They took out the word, I mean, they took out the Ten Commandments, the teaching of the Bible. They thought that the story of the Good Samaritan caused the uh, psychological damage to kids. <laughs> they thought the Beatitudes were detrimental to the learning of kids. When you read about all this, is that sick or what? Trying to teach people a moral way of life they thought was not good for them. In 1973, abortion became legal. And it wasn't enough that the highest court in the land said no more prayer in schools in 1980. And now here we are today, much like ancient Israel in this time of her history. In 1991, my good friend Bill Clinton announced his candidacy for president. And he used a phrase called a culture war. What does that mean? Well, it's a war against biblical values. That's what it means. It's, it's a big fancy word called existentialism. That's pretty good for a Texan to say that. Existentialism. <laughs> and this, this big word, I try not to use big words because I can't get them out. Anyway, this big word means it, it means if it feels good, do it. Do you see what's happening in our country right now? It's It's nuts. In our inner cities, you know, there's no more police. Criminals are getting set free. Good people are getting locked up. Everything has turned upside down, and it started way back 70 years ago when they started taking God out of this nation. So, number two, Elijah, a troubler of Israel. Let's get back on Elijah now. It's going to be good. But not really the one causing the trouble. Now, it's real interesting because I've always said, I've even asked God, make me a troubler of Rapid City. Make me a troubler of South Dakota. Make me a troubler for the word of God where I go. Give me boldness. I pray that. I don't think that's wrong to pray that. 
Like I said, Amy mentioned watchmen in this church. There's some in this church that God is going to raise up. I feel it in my bones. I, I see it. I see this church like Scott does, that this church is going to be used powerfully in the days ahead. Are you with me? It is. <clears throat> Let me read these verses to you. It's 1 Kings 18, 17 through 19. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? So Ahab, this wicked king, said, This guy causes lots of trouble for me and my kingdom. Because he's telling the truth. Amen. But this is what I caught this time, and I'd never seen this before. And he answered, this is Elijah answering back, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have caused the trouble. Did you catch that? So this Elijah's got boldness. He's got a little grit. Here this wicked king goes, you're the problem. And Elijah looks at him going, no, nope, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. <laughs> you're the problem. I'd never seen that before until I was reading it this time. You're the problem. It's like if you're at a school board, they're going to tell you that you're the problem. You Christians are the problem. You're the ones causing all the trouble in this nation. If you just be quiet, sit down, shut up, we could do what we want to do. We could run this thing the right way. You know, socialism, communism, Marxism. They don't want you to say anything. So if you open your mouth, you're going to be called the problem. That's where courage comes in and say, no, I'm not the problem. I'm the one that loves you enough to tell you the truth. They'll say, well, you don't love people. Oh, yeah, I do. I love you enough to tell you the truth. And you do too. These people in this church do, to, do the same thing. So, and then he goes on to say, and this is what, this is Elijah speaking. Because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the bells. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel. The 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asheroth who eat at Jezebel's table. So in the kingdom of Israel, there was nothing but evil and evil gods that they were worshiping. Number three, a showdown between the gods. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. Many of us heard this story. Some of you may not. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? <laughs> that right there is enough to stop on. How long are you going to waver in your belief with Christ and God? We do it. Sometimes we get in a place of doubt. And we falter, is God really God? Is God really going to take me through this? Is God really going to meet my needs? Is God really going to fix this addiction and save this situation I am? How long am I going to falter back and forth? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> and then he goes on, he said, if Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. They, he got them. He said, hey, make up your mind. Get it, you know, I was going to say something I shouldn't have said. But anyway, make up your mind. <laughs> then Elijah said to the people, I alone and left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you call upon the name of your gods, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. The fire of the Holy Spirit. In every gospel, he says we need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. In all, now when, it, when it mentions it in all four gospels, it must be important. I pray all the time for an outpouring of spirit into this church body and believers. Pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit. It's not, nothing wrong. Pray. Ask and you'll receive. Amen. And actually, when you look at that scripture in Luke, he says that if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he'll give it to you. If you look at it in there. But anyway, so, so here we have this showdown. And so here's these uh, evil people and they cut up their bull and they start dancing around like a bunch of crazy people and nothing's happening and they start cutting themselves and they think boy if I could just get some blood going here then the gods that we worship are going to show up and set this this sacrifice on fire guess what I love Elijah he says this he says and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them see it's okay to be kind of a smart aleck for God 
Come on, man. I should have got an amen from every one of y'all. It's okay to be a smart aleck for God once in a while. Nanner, nanner, nanner. Your God didn't show up. Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud for he's God. He's either meditating or sleeping or he's busy or he's on a journey. Taking too long of a nap. And he must be woke up. So they cried aloud and cut themselves some more, as was their custom with knives and lances, until blood gushed out on them. Midday was past. They prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention because their gods are dead. Our God is alive. Then, all the, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord. Let me tell you, that little phrase is real important for us. He followed the instructions. Uh-oh. Hello. Basic instructions before leaving earth. He followed the instruction manual. He rebuilt the altar according to scripture. So when we're in church, there's an order. We're to live according to the rules of God. The Ten Commandments of the Lord. Amen. Amen. By the power of the Spirit in us, we're able to say no to the sin and yes to the commandments. So Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the whole thing. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood. He filled up four water pots with water and poured it all on this sacrifice. And then he told the people helping him, do it a second time, do it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. See, he did everything according to the law. This is really good. He didn't do it out of order. He did it at the time of the sacrifice. He knew when God would show up. Then Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, in Israel, let it be known to you this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant. That I've done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God. And that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. And the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said... The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Amen. God showed up in a powerful way. And he killed the prophets of Baal. I thought about the National Mall in Washington, D.C. What if we had a show down there? Y'all come on outside, all you politicians, right and left, because they're all, you know, kind of messed up now, in my opinion. But y'all come on out. We're going to have a showdown. You put your best stuff out here in the National Mall, and you call on your gods, and you see if your gods can come down here and burn up all our history books and burn up our Bibles and burn up all this stuff. That's not going to happen because the truth is going to keep marching on. Amen. Amen. And then we call upon our God and he moves by the Holy Spirit in a situation like that and convicts the hearts of men and women and they're changed there on that spot. That'd be a cool showdown to have. Amen. And see, I believe God is going to raise up men with that kind of authority. I believe he's doing it. Right now, I believe he's, he's working on them right now. It may be you. Never underestimate the power of God. Judgment has ended. So here we go. After all these prophets are killed, judgment has ended. After the great victory over the false prophets, rain once again fell on the land. Elijah prayed for rain and it began to rain. James chapter 5, 16 and 18 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man like a na with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three and a half years. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. 
I want to stop there for a minute. Most of y'all know that uh, I believe that we should be praying. We should be a praying people. If you have some situation in your life that you have a hard time with, please get with me and I'll help you make a prayer for it. Please get with Pastor Scott or one of the elders. Talk to someone if something's weighing you down in your life. Would you? Because there's power in group prayer. There's power when someone comes alongside of you and prays with you. And teaches you how to pray. And what I like about Elijah, and I'm going to tell you a little story. I like Elijah because it says he had a nature like us. So that, I read that as he might have been a little wishy-washy. You know what I mean? Plus he was 80 years old supposedly when he did all this. Amen. So he wasn't no young whippersnapper. And, um, but he had a like nature like us. But I've read books by great men of God that said Elisha was the greater of the two. And I beg to differ. Because see what happened between Elijah and Elisha is when Elisha, when Elijah was about ready to die, he asked Elisha, what do you want me to give you? And Elijah said, I, I want a double portion of your spirit. Now Solomon asked for wisdom, which was good, but he turned out a bad guy. Okay. God asked him, what do you want? And he said, wisdom. But he turned out bad. But here's Elisha and he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. I said, boy, I wish that would happen to me. I wouldn't have been a big sinner if I'd had two portions of the spirit. So it doesn't have anything recorded about Elisha sinning. See what I'm saying? Because he had a double portion of the Spirit. He did twice as many miracles. But Elijah was a like nature, just like us, but he did big miracles. So this new year, and I'm getting ready to show you how Elijah messed up. Elijah messed up. And he did some things he shouldn't have done. But God went ahead and used him anyway. You may have messed up in 2022. You may have had some things set you back. You may have called to God and he hadn't answered your prayer the way you thought it ought to be answered. But I'm telling you, in 2023, he wants to set you free. He wants to use you and matter no matter what you've been through or what you're going through. He says, I'm going to use you because I'm not through with you yet. Those mistakes you made are all part of the process and the plan. We think that some people have to be this per perfect person in order to do great things for God. Boy, the Bible I read is full of people that didn't do anything right. Jim and his crickets. I mean, I can name on one hand the one that did everything right. Enoch walked with God, was no more. Daniel, there was nothing written bad about him. Mm -hmm, this is crickets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the rest of them failed miserably, but they understood God. They understood his forgiveness. They understood his power. They understood his faith. They understood his breakthrough. Hmm. So in spite of this great victory, Elijah entered a period of wavering faith and depression. Jezebel heard of God's power and instead of turning to God, she wants to kill the messenger. Does that sound familiar today? <laughs> they want to get rid of us people. Sounds like something we would see happen today, don't you think? Hearing this, Elijah flees to the wilderness where he prayed to God to take his life. He got on a pity party. Anybody ever been on a pity party? Yeah. Even great men of God get weak. Amen. So, then he took a 40-day journey to Mount Horeb and he hid in a cave. He even prayed to God to take his life. Even King David got depressed. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted into me? For I will hope thou in God, for you are the one that I praise. He got out of it. Another place in 1 Samuel chapter 30, David got attacked by the Amalekites and he, they lost everything. And it says that he, he strengthened himself in the Lord. He encouraged, another verse that says he encouraged himself in the Lord. When you get down, you can find a time and a place with another person. You can encourage yourself in the Lord. Some of you have heard my story. I was on all kind of antidepressants and anti all them pills. I don't take any of them no more. I don't need them. Do I still get down some days? Yep. But I know how to kick myself back up. I know how to do it. Now let me get to the, this, this part here. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you hiding out in a cave for? Don't you just love it when God talks to you like that? He talks to me like this. What are you thinking, knucklehead? That's what he say. Are you going to be a knucklehead again? How about just keep doing things my way instead of the way you think is right? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. So he starts tooting his own horn. God's not impressed when we start blowing our own horn and telling him how great we are. 
For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. They seek to take my life. <laughs> he thought he was the only one left. But he had to have known that Obadiah was in the king's court and he hit a hundred of the prophets for safety's sake. So he had to know about that. So he might have been a little delusional or something. I'm not real sure, but he had to have known of them. And um, he says, I alone am left and they're seeking to take my life because Jezebel wanted to kill all the prophets. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. You'd think that'd get his attention. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice, a whispering in some translations. A whispering. That's how God speaks to us. I wish he'd come in with a big booming voice, but it might scare the heck out of me. <laughs> so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, he's on a pity party again. You know who comes to a pity party? Me, myself, and I. <laughs> he said, I have been zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. Says it again, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel, Maholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So it is said of these 7,000 other prophets that they were hidden. It says they were hidden. So maybe he didn't know about these 7,000. Apparently he didn't. But what he's telling him is you're not, you're not alone. I often wonder if these 7,000 may have been praying for Elijah. Maybe they were like the church body praying for their leader. Maybe they were the ones that, they're the reason that the miracle happened. Men of God need people praying for them. Doesn't say they were, but just kind of think outside the box. Were the 7,000 men that were prophets praying for Elijah because he was bold and he had access to the king and all that kind of stuff? It's a picture for us as the church to always pray. Pray, pray, pray. I told you a little something about prayer and I thought of something just now. That Elijah was a man of prayer. We have a lot, a lot of us in here like watching all the news. We like Bit Shoot. We like uh, Newsmax. We like Rumble. We like Tucker Carlson. We like all that. We spend three, four hours a day watching all that stuff and that's good. We're watchmen. But I want to encourage you, if you're spending three hours a day watching that... I want to encourage you to find an hour a day with the Lord. I'm not talking about listening on the radio. I'm talking about getting in his word in a quiet time, praying and seeking God. You, you won't regret it. You may, when I, when I, I don't understand this because I can't do it. But if I neglect my spiritual life, I can't function. So I don't know how people function without a spiritual life. My sufficiency is in Christ. But if I'm not spending time with Christ, how can I be sufficient? See what I'm saying? Let's keep going. I want to take just a minute of why I believe Elijah is greater than Elisha. Even though Elisha did twice the miracles, he had twice the spirit. And here's my main reason. In the New Testament, Elijah is mentioned 17 times. 17 times. And Elisha is only mentioned once. In the New Testament, when um, Elijah, Moses, and Jesus showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, it wasn't Elisha with him. It was Elijah. Amen. And so the reason I'm saying all this is to say this to you. Because God wants to do something brand new with you this year in 2023. So 
here's this guy, Elijah, who was a mighty man of God. And here was this other guy named Elisha, who was a mighty man of God. But he's not mentioned in the New Testament. And you know why he's not mentioned? That? This is my opinion. Didn't read it anywhere. Because God likes to take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the base things of the world and the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are so that no flesh can glory in his presence. He likes to take the broken and downtrodden and turn it into something good and use you for miracles. Can you believe with me today that you're going to do miracles? Can you believe me today, believe with me today that you're going to be impactful in somebody's life? He wants to use you in that way. He wants to use you. So I'd like to, I'd like to share some verses with you. So uh, in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things below, for you are, hit, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So let me explain this uh, scripture to you real quick. We're supposed to be seeking those things that are above, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be seeking Christ. He's sitting on the right hand of the throne of God, ever interceding for us. We're supposed to set our affections on things above. Do you know what that little phrase means? I'm glad you asked. It's, a, it's an athletic term. And it means to exercise your mind like you exercise your body. So we have to guard our mind, the things that are coming in and out of our mind. We've got to exercise it. Amen. It's easy to let the devil come in and start lying to you. Let me keep going. Mortify. Mortify. Do you know what that word means? The same passage. Mortify means put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. I'm going to stop there for a minute. This is hard for me to touch on, but I'm going to touch on it. Fornication comes from the Greek word pornea. It's where we get the word pornography. Pornography is very destructive in the life of a person that looks at it. It's a shame-based addiction. It's easy to do because you've got your little iPhone and you can watch it any time. It gets a hold of you like a snake. It's hard to let go of. 70% of men in the church struggle with pornography. These are some staggering numbers coming from Covenant Eyes. Uh, it's a website that you can help control your porn if you're accountable to somebody with it. 50% uh, of pastors struggle with pornography in the church in America. This is from Covenant Eyes Research 2021. This one's going to be alarming. Before you start nudging your husband or look at your boyfriend, 87% uh, of the women in church have looked at porn. Now, I didn't say they were addicted to it. They've looked at it. So it's becoming more prevalent in the lives of women. I'm not here to pick on you. I believe the church is only as strong as its weakest link. And I believe God is calling this church to a place of purity and wholeness, freedom. And that's the only reason I'm bringing up pornography. If you struggle with that, uh, there's help for you. You can get free of it. Okay? It's, it's possible to get free from this grip. And trust me, when Paul says he's the chief of sinners, I feel like I'm the chief, chief of sinners. And I've come out of all kind of junk. And I don't have those thoughts anymore because I work my way through it. And don't think God's going to zap you and deliver you from some of this kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Because it do normally doesn't happen that way. Normally you need to have somebody help you walk through it. It's a process. You know, there's positional sanctification, there's positional righteousness, but then there's progressive sanctification and progressive righteousness. That's how I look at it. There's a working out of your salvation with fear and trembling. So mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, idolatry. Put off all these anger, wrath, malice. There's people in this room today that still have a problem with anger in their home. When I ask you to get some help, try to get rid of it. It's not good for your home. Rage is not good. There's people in this room today that hold on to grudges and bitterness and resentments and unforgiveness. I'm asking you today to get it, get it right with God. Okay? I'm asking you to get it right with God. He wants to set you free. That's the motto today. Free in 23. Amen? I'm not here to pick on you. I'm here to see you whole in Christ. I want you to be all that you can be. 
And then he says, let no filthy communication come out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. I want to stop at that little phrase. Image of him. Comes from the Greek word icon. So this is what I was thinking about this morning. Because I woke up at three. Reading over my notes. I always wake up too early, but oh well. Anyway. Let me tell you how you do this. If you wake up early in the morning, you get a cup of synthetic grace. <laughs> better, known, better known as coffee. You sit down, you open your Bible, and you start reading and praying. And next thing you know, you're having communion with the Lord. Amen. If you don't like coffee, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. But anyway. <laughs> so so this, this little phrase, uh, image of him, comes from a Greek word called icon, where we get the name of icon copiers. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could lay on a big copier and the thing goes, and out comes this big piece of paper and it looked like Jesus. Because he's telling us he wants us to look like Jesus. We're created in the image of him who created us. See, we're working out that righteousness from the inside out. We're saved. We're sanctified. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus but we're still, he's always asked us to be more like him. Fill me more of your love, Lord. Fill me with more of your patience, Lord. Your compassion. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up. James 1 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed, and after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. See the process? You see the process? David said he saw a beautiful woman bathing. He was out on his porch, not porch, but his fancy mansion that he castle and it always starts with the eyes when it comes to sexual sin it's the eyes is the wind of the soul so don't say don't blame it on god god's not tempting you. your own evil desire is what's bringing the temptation into your life amen and so uh here's where i want to go this is the end of what i wanted to share with you this is isaiah 43 18 and 19 he says remember not the former things so you've struggled with some things in 2022 you didn't get your breakthrough. Forget the former thing. Forget what happened last year. Make a new plan this year. Say, I'm going to get with somebody. I'm going to beat this addiction. I'm going to beat this thing that I'm struggling with. You can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit in the presence of God through Jesus Christ. I promise. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie to you. I'm living proof that you can get rid of those sinful thought patterns in your mind. Okay? Nor consider the things of whole. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it shall spring, spring forth. Can you not perceive it? I will make a road in the wilderness and a river in the desert. I want you to just picture that for a minute. A road in the wilderness. You know, maybe a forest. He makes a road for us. And a river in the desert. You don't see rivers in the desert. But God says, you come back to me. Forget that junk. I'm going to set you free in 23. It'd be like a river in the wilderness. I want to be around a river full of life. You know, in the, in the Bible, the river is, you know, in Psalm 1 said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaf shall also not wither, and whatever he does that shall, not, that shall not fall. Amen? Amen? Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. I'm asking everybody in this room today, we haven't arrived yet. That's what he's saying. I haven't arrived yet. So as long as I'm here, I'm going to forget those things that are behind. One thing I do forget. You know, have, have you ever just figured out how many hours you waste regretting the past? 
kicking yourself in the tail. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? How come I didn't do that better? Anybody ever done that? Or am I the only one? (laughs) Forgetting those things that are behind. He didn't say two things to do. He said one thing to do. But one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. And reaching. That's a picture of a runner. He's reaching for the finish line. Amen. I press toward that prize of the goal of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 9 8 says, And God is able. Everybody say, God is able. able. One more time. God is able. Go home, Google God is able, and look at all the verses that say God is able. You'll be encouraged. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, so that at all things, at all times, having all that you need, you may abound in every good work. Did you hear how many times all was said? Every All in every. He didn't say all grace abounds towards you so that in three things you can abound. And in four things you might get by. And in some things you might be victorious. He didn't say that. He said all, 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 everything. Any questions? God's grace is there for to empower you. I just thought of a verse. So let me see if I can get it to you. It's in Titus Titus chapter 2. It says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us and redeemed us. God, I can't remember the rest of it. I got it. And purified for us a people for him that are zealous for good works. So let me let me break that down. Amen. So did you catch that? The grace of God teaches us to say no to a worldliness and ungodliness. Worldly passions and ungodliness. Then over in Galatians 5, he says, the spirit. Lust against the flesh and the flesh against the, against the spirit. And these are contrary to one another. So you don't do the things that you should not do. And then in chapter 8 of Romans, hallelujah to Romans. He said, if, if, uh, if by the spirit I put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So with the grace of God and the spirit of God, we can't lose. You can't lose if you have the grace of God and the spirit of God working in your favor. That's a win-win. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20, now unto him who is able, there's that who is able, God is able, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think according to the power that works in you. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who always, how many times? Always. Always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ set you free. He already set you free. It's already been done. We don't fight from victory. We don't fight to victory. We fight from victory. Did you get that? We fight from victory. The victory's already been done. Those are things that are hard to get in my mind. They're hard to get in our mind. We fight from victory, not to victory. He says that. Let me read that to you again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you free, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. In closing today, I want to to stop with this verse. 2 Corinthians 3.17. It says, now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father God, I I know this message wasn't for everybody, but I know it was for somebody. And you said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking you now to move, to speak, to empower people. To cry out to you and say, I want to get free from whatever's been holding me back. I want to get free from whatever's been holding me back. So, if you're praying that prayer right now, I'm going to just pray that, uh, Lord, I'm going to ask that every person that is praying that prayer, that you give them strength and courage to reach out. To help, ask someone to help them through this journey. Someone they can trust. 
And right now, Lord, I want to pray for this body of believers. I want to pray, God, that you bless them powerful in 2023. Pray supernatural abundance in their lives, supernatural health. Uh, just pray for their family members, their children, their businesses. Every part of their lives be touched by the blessings of God. The Bible says if we obey him, the blessings of God will chase us down and overtake us. So today, God, we just release those blessings in the lives of everyone here. We pray right now, Lord, that Landmark Community Church continue to be a light in a dark world, a hospital for the sick, and hope for the hopeless. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We fight from victory. Right. Amen. It's already done. It is already done, already overcome. Just stand, let's sing together.